Morning and welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Today makes it one year since Russia launched a full-scale invasion on, on Ukraine, which has resulted in the deaths of thousands of people, destruction of many cities, and forced millions of Ukrainians to become refugees. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky marked the first anniversary with a somber message of defiance to his people, saying we will defeat everyone. In a video released to the media titled The Year of Invincibility, the 45-year-old sat at a desk and recalled how he addressed Ukrainians a year ago in a hurried statement as Kyiv and the world reeled from Russia's act of war. Great nation of great Ukraine. A year ago on this day, from this same place around 7 in the morning, I addressed you with a brief statement lasting only 67 seconds. We will defeat all threats, shelling, bomb, missiles, kamikaze, drones, blackouts, cold. We are stronger than all this. It was a year of endurance, a year of compassion, a year of bravery, a year of pain, a year of hope, a year of perseverance, a year of unity, a year of invincibility, a fierce year of invincibility. Its main conclusion is that we have survived, we have not been defeated, and we will do everything to win this war. The VOA's Anna Chernikova joins us now. Anna, what has happened today being the first anniversary since the war began? Good evening. Uh, yeah, it's an extremely emotional day today for the whole Ukraine. And uh, starting from the very early in the morning, um, some official uh, events took place. Uh, the President Zelensky, uh, the head of Ukrainian army, Valery Zeluzhny, and Minister of um, uh, Minister of Defense, um, uh, Mr. Reznikov, they uh, had um, th they participated in the official um, event, uh, was raising flag and uh, uh, and giving awards to Ukrainian soldiers for some. Um, unfortunately for for dead soldiers for their families but also for those who still uh who still fight uh, and defend ukraine at the front lines uh, and uh, now a press conference of president zelensky is happening but uh just as we are talking but president zelensky already made his main speech uh also very early in the morning. Uh, it was the first thing uh, to do today for him. And uh, it was a lot of reflection, of course, on this day a year ago, uh, but also a lot of, um, well, a lot of plans for the future. I think uh, it could be put this way because uh, of course, President Zelensky mentioned that this year uh, should be a year of victory and that uh, Ukraine would do everything to make it possible. And I'm sure that there are a lot of memories flooding in today for many people regarding uh, this day when they remember, um, you know, what they were doing even before the war began. A few days ago, people began posting the last pictures they took before the war started. What do Ukrainians remember most how life was like before all of that changed? You know, I talked to a lot of, actually, to a lot of Ukrainians, not only from Kyiv, but from other regions. And... Um, I think that the common thing that people are saying is that, uh, first of all, this year made them much stronger. And uh, what they remember is that this the same day last year, they were scared because it was something they didn't know what how to live this through and uh, how to act in such conditions. Today, uh, they... so. They don't really look back to their old life. I think that people more adapt to to the reality, and they definitely look forward for new reality life. But I don't see people, you know. So no one t told me, "Oh, I want my my life before war, war back." Everyone is saying instead that they've adapted, they became stronger, and they, of course, hope for war to end as soon as possible uh, but again not just just like whatever they want the war to be to end with the ukrainian victory uh, and uh, they also say that they're looking forward to rebuild the country and to rebuild their lives and uh, to build on their this new reality for them uh, and i think this is probably the main message from people and uh, 
basically people saying some you know similar message with different words but uh this is exactly the main meaning of of, of that and of course a lot of people remember how uh, you know how shocked they were on the first day of the full-scale invasion some shocked some angry some wanted to you know to leave the country but come back some wanted just to escape because they were uh, scared for their children for example or for their relatives some uh, had different feelings and wanted to go straight to the front line or straight to get their weapon and and uh, and start defending the country so a lot of reflections this day and uh, these days, uh, not only today, but also yesterday, and I think that upcoming days as well, uh, we, we will hear a lot. But um, most of people are actually saying that they th this year may ha have made them much stronger. Yes, and I know that just a, a few days ago, President Zelensky was remembering those who had lost their lives during the war. Um, he went to, I think it was a wall of remembrance or something. Um, where, where they had the names of the soldiers and people, some most of the people who had lost their lives during the war. Um, do Ukrainians remember that? Do they, do they remember that people actually died, how the Russians invaded their cities, invaded their towns and took over, how people ran helter-skelter and how, you know, there was defiance against the Russian forces, I think, in, in, in Kherson at some point, uh, the people eventually uh, forcing the Russian troops there out at some point. Do they also remember the little victories that they have also gotten? The fact that Bakhmut is still holding stronger despite the um, tirade of attacks that Russia has been making on the town itself. And then despite the fact that, you know, Ukraine has lost four regions now to Russian uh, uh, annexation and so on. Do they remember the little victories that have also been won? The fact that they have the Western allies on their side, the weapons that they need to fight this war, and that they also have a courageous leader who is still defiant in the face of all of these? Uh, well, I should say that, well, first of all, answering your question, of course, people remember and people remember everyone who died. Of, I mean, there are names in this wall, the one that you mentioned, the wall of remembrance and President Biden, when he was visiting Ukraine, he also uh, visited this place. It's located in the very heart of Kiev, in the very city center. And a lot of people actually, when they walk uh, through the city, they goes pass by this wall and a lot of people stop by and pay attention and today i was next to this wall and i've seen a lot of people uh, both military people and civilians just just walking you know passing through this wall and and looking in the faces of these people who died and uh, you can see uh, basically this face uh, so these people the names and and photos uh, are um, are arranged um, according to the year uh, of, of war when they died because it's for nine years now that this wall was you know uh, growing and uh, it's almost no space anymore on this wall so I think it will be somehow you know uh, well uh, pr probably prolonged uh, to a different place or something uh, people uh, I should say uh, people definitely remember I think that um, such shock that Ukrainians uh, had to live through, especially from these first days of war, it's 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 difficult to ever forget and difficult to ever you know make uh, make an in important. So for people, it's always going to be something to remember, and uh, definitely this would affect uh, their future. But um, I should say that. Uh, at this point of war, people are very determined to fight, to continue the, their fight. And uh, this is something that I can feel uh, being here uh, in Kyiv, for instance, I can feel that when, if at the beginning of war, the city of Kyiv was kind of empty. And then um, when Ukra Ukrainian forces liberated Kyiv region, uh, most of Kyiv citizens came back, at least, I mean, a lot of Kyiv citizens came back. Now Kyiv is full of people, full of life, and uh, the mood is uh, very, you know, uh, is very courageous. So uh, I don't think that this year made people tired of war or anything like that. It made people, it just, you know, a milestone for the next stage of, of, of fight. This is how 
people look at it and feel it. So, um, well, I think this is probably probably uh, the, the main point, and it's it's really it's really uh, interesting to watch people, you know, changing their perception of war because now it's absolutely it's a completely different perception of war than it was before. I talked to one person from Kiev, and uh, a lady told me that. At the beginning, uh, it was a feeling like, you know, in these movies about Second World War. So you you have this perception of war from the movies uh, because you haven't experienced something like that before. And now when you know the reality uh, of how it actually was, uh, you've changed your perception. And this is what she pointed out, that now she... Uh, she has uh, absolutely different reactions to, to to what's happening, but of course, uh, it's always difficult to to hear and to see people die and to hear all this, you know, um, names of the fallen soldiers. I, I guess this is the most difficult for everyone. It is difficult for everyone, and Anna, we admire your courage. Uh, it almost looks like a normal day for you, unfortunately. But thanks again for joining us on the program, and we hope that you find some peace today. Uh, amidst all of the war in Ukraine. Thank you. Well, it's been a day of speeches for President Volodymyr Zelensky. He had spoken earlier um, about Ukraine's unflinching uh, defiance against Russia, but he also had time to thank allies and well wishes as well. He thanked the UK for unwavering support over last year in his characteristically flag emoji laden style. The Ukrainian president thanked the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the British people for their unwavering support in the face of Russia's aggression. He said, your help in hard times is invaluable. Uh, he wrote on Twitter, Zelensky says a new sanction, sanctions package, the 10th against Russia, announced today is evidence of unwavering British solidarity with his nation. He said we'll be hearing more directly, uh, but we'll be hearing more directly from uh, Zelensky, who's still speaking uh, to the people of Ukraine as well as the people of the world. Um, he also has been thanking journalists as well who've had to work in Ukraine over the last year, especially international journalists who have been the ones bringing us some of the videos that we have been featuring on the program over the last one year. He calls for a minute of silence to remember those who died in the conflict. President uh, Zelensky also has thanked countries who supported Ukraine over the last year, including those who voted at last night's UN meeting where a resolution was agreed to demand Russia leaves Ukraine immediately. He also appealed to some regions and countries who have been less forthright with their support about for Ukraine. President Zelensky says it like Latin America, Africa, China and India to all be part of the Ukraine-Russia peace process. He has been answering questions from journalists who have been, <clears throat> excuse me, reacting to the press briefing he just gave. Uh, one media outlet from Ukraine had asked about China's involvement and his assessment of allegations China might be supporting Russia. President Zelensky says it's a good thing that China is talking about Ukraine and respects that Beijing is speaking about territorial integrity. Now, along with China's respect for international law, Zelensky says that they want to put these aspirations to good use and work on that with China. He's been taking selfies uh, with people there at the press briefing as well. Poland has delivered its uh, four leopard tanks, uh, prepared quickly uh, for delivery on the anniversary of the Russian invasion today. Ukraine is hoping its allies will send dozens more of the German-made tanks and that this could prove a game-changer on the battlefield. As it stands now, Russia still occupies a fifth of Ukrainian territory and appears to be restarting major offences across the vast front line. Former Permanent Secretary and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Joe Keshi, joins me now. He's in Abuja. Ambassador Keshi, thank you for joining me on the programme today. Yes, Ambassador Keshi is not the one on the line. My apologies. Um, political and international affairs analyst Professor Femi Otumba, Otumbajo uh, joins me now. He's here in Lagos, but joining us from his studio uh, at home. Professor, thank you for making time to be with me on the program. And you were with me yesterday. We were talking on the eve of the war 
uh, in Ukraine and how far that they have come. And of course, there is that video that has been making the rounds of an European MP uh, condemning uh, uh, colleagues for their role, he, that she said, um, helped to instigate this war, which also helped to perpetrate it. And now they're refusing to take responsibility for what has happened. Instead, are perpetrating even more violence, helping to perpetrate more violence in Ukraine. Yes, I, I, I share that uh, sentiment. Uh, the Western power, the European powers and the United States seem to have stuck to their narrative, uh, which fortunately or unfortunately they have sold to 141 countries that voted at the UN General Assembly yesterday, that uh, Russia is the aggressor and therefore uh, must withdraw from Ukraine. Uh, the reality, of course, is that in the Western powers that are showing up Ukraine to be able to resist Russia. Um, of course, everybody is, uh, has a platform on which it is basing its argument. The major reason, the major argument of the West is that sovereignty is being infringed. Uh, of course, Russia is talking of its own strategic interest, does not want the NATO member at his doorstep. But it is the Western European and United States that are uh, behind the, the ability of, so far, of the Ukrainians to resist. Unfortunately, that resistance is at a very, very, very heavy cost. And the Western powers must take responsibility for it. Even the United Nations uh, resolution uh, seems to have tilted itself to the perspective of the Western powers to say that Ukraine must get out of, uh, of uh, uh, that Russia must get out of Ukraine and withdraw its troops. Of course, we know this is international posturing. Uh, a lot will be going on on the ground. The UN should be seeking resolution, not condemnation. Uh, the, Russia is preparing for a spring offensive. Uh, the Western powers are arming uh, Ukraine to be able to resist. They're giving Leopard tanks, they're giving uh, uh, bloody fighting vehicles and all kinds of ways. But you must ask yourselves, in the last one year, what has been achieved by both sides? What has been achieved by Ukraine? Ukraine has attracted to itself horrendous destruction. Six cities, major cities in Ukraine have been virtually wiped out by the Russians. 1,162 towns and villages are in blackout because Russia has embarked in the last few months on degrading the electrical infrastructure of Ukraine. Ukraine is the one that is suffering destruction, not Russia, not Germany, not uh, Berlin, not uh, Washington. What they are doing is supplying all these weapons, which of course is also showing up their domestic economy, their arms production industry, and so on. So the world cannot afford for this world to linger. In the last one year, we have suffered from the consequences of the war. The collateral damage has been significant. We have suffered from uh, shortages of food. We have su suffered from shortages of fuel, of fertilizers, areas in which Ukraine has been a major uh, uh, supplier. We and the poverty level has increased, and we can see from the countries of the world, particularly the smaller, less developed countries, that there's a lot of instability, a lot of tension, a lot of unrest, because the poverty uh, index has grown. People have no access. You used to be able to buy plantain for yeah, a, a, a two bar of yam, 200, 300, now 1,000, one, two. So you can only buy slices of yam. That is a direct consequence of this war. So we need to put an end to it, not for the sake of the Ukrainians alone, but for the sake of the war. The danger, of course, is that if we don't put an end to it, Russia will go in in the spring and cause more destruction. And the world will be outraged. What is going to happen after that? Right now, there's a stalemate. Nobody is winning, nobody is losing. But Russia has the military advantage. Ukraine will continue to be 
prostate to fight back. But can it win? There's no, I've never seen any analysis that indicates that Russia will win. But there's in the West, in the US, the assumption and the uh, hypothesis, the proposition that it was possible for Russia to be defeated. And if Russia is defeated, what next? But I, yeah, I don't I, see that it, as a viable. You, you, uh, you, make, you, make, a, you um, make a valid point. You make a really valid point, Professor, you know. <laughs> Um, especially when we talk about, you know, who's really winning this war. And my question is, yeah. is this a war to be won? Is this really a war to be won? Is it really about winning? Because the way it's going, yeah. Ukraine is fighting so hard. Russia is also fighting so hard. Um, despite everything that's happened, despite the sanctions, the Russian economy is predicted to increase by 0.5% yes. at least this year to appreciate. Yes. And that's interesting because, you know, Russia is still making imports, they're still exporting, they still have partners on the other side of the world who are still helping to buoy its economy. So is this really a war to be won? It is not, for everybody's sake. Uh, the Ukrainians cannot win, not because they cannot push back the Russians, but they will never be able to regain Crimea and the Donbass region. That has to be their strategic objective, to be able to maintain total control over their sovereignty, but that's not likely. The Russians themselves may not be able to take the whole of Ukraine, but they might be able to, to maintain their control of that region, that the Donbass region. So it is not about winning to the point at which, but of course, if they succeed with their uh, spring offensive, they might be able to push towards Kiev, and then what happens after that? The Russians will drive away the government of uh, uh, Zelensky and impose his own regime there. So we don't need to go that far. But the world is not taking the necessary action to stop this war. The thing that it is a war that must be won by the West. The West must bring down Russia, and Russia, of course, being a military power. Russia is not a great economic power. It is not an ideological power in the sense that it was under Soviet Union. So we cannot even see the sense of this war except all this totally talk about sovereignty, which Russia counters with its own uh, argument about its own strategic national interest. So uh, there's no, there's no, it's not a winnable war in the sense in which some, uh, in Ukraine will be overrun and uh, uh, Russia will become, it will become a territory of Russia. I don't think that the world will want to accept that. But Russia has a better chance, really, of doing that than Ukraine has of recovering those territories that Russia has uh, occupied. Professor Femi Otubanjo, thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate your insight and your analysis uh, on the program, especially in the past one year. Thank you. Welcome back to the world today. A special edition of the Russian invasion marking one year since Russia invaded Ukraine. Over 30 Western countries have set up military support to Ukraine since the start of the war. Polish Defense Ministry says a first delivery of Leopard 2 tanks has arrived in Ukraine. It's prepared to deliver more quickly. This next report looks at various international support that's been provided to Ukraine in what Kyiv hopes will be a turning point to aid its fight in the prolonged war. All the Leopard 2 A4 tanks. Abrams tanks, Challenger 2 tanks, Leopard tanks, combat vehicles, Bradley fighting vehicles, Patriot missiles, long-range rockets, howitzers, among others, are part of military aid sent by international countries to Ukraine to help support its fight against Russia's invasion. General Austin will tell you it's been critical. Poland has delivered its first Leopard tanks to Ukraine. That's according to the country's president and its defense. The first delivery comes less than a month after Poland said it aimed to get training time on Leopard 2 tanks down to five weeks for Ukrainian soldiers. The United States announced a $2 billion aid package to Ukraine as Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin vowed that the U.S. would stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. The security package includes more rounds for the HEMA's rocket launchers, more artillery ammunition, as well as different drones and counter-drone equipment.
Britain's Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, on the other hand, said that he would support allies if they decided to send fighter jets to Ukraine now. I said what I've done is say to all allies that we stand ready to support them if they can provide uh, fighter jets to Ukraine now. And for our part, we're also leading the world in training Ukrainian pilots on NATO standard aircraft. That's the right thing to do because this is about giving Ukraine the means to defend themselves and win this war. That's about more air defense. It's about armored vehicles. Uh, it's about long range weapons. The UK is out in front in all of these things. And it's important that we continue to do so and lead because we all want to see Ukraine succeed. In light of that, Britain began to warm up its production lines to replace weapons sent to Ukraine and increase production of artillery shells to try to help Kyiv push back Russian forces. Britain has already given more than 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers basic training in drone warfare and has been training tank crews since late January. The Czech Republic has supplied hundreds of pieces of heavy military equipment to Ukraine over the past year and will continue supporting efforts to aid Kyiv. Lithuania, on the other hand, shipped anti-craft guns to Ukraine. Lithuanian army spokesperson said the guns would help the Ukrainian military destroy aerial threats, including drones, as well as crewed aircraft. This gun uh, is perfectly used for air defense, especially to fight with UAVs, helicopters, airplanes. Uh, and we believe it will be very useful in nowadays Ukrainian situation, in nowadays war, uh, and will help to, to protect their people. It's in full working condition. Uh, a week ago, we had a training with Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, we, have, we had a light uh, firing exercise. Also, the Ukrainians uh, were trained how to use this equipment. And why we are doing this is the uh, answer is very simple. Lithuania is with Ukraine uh, from the beginning of the war, from 2014. The L-70, developed in Sweden by Bofors, is an automatic anti-craft cannon that can target and take down targets from a distance of up to five kilometers. Germany said it will supply its Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, overcoming misgivings about sending heavy weaponry that Kyiv sees as crucial to defeat Russia's invasion, but Moscow casts a dangerous provocation. Germany's decision. So much spent on this war in one year alone. More than 100,000 people have been killed. Uh, it's the highest number of people killed uh, in a war since the Second World War, beg your pardon. Uh, tens of thousands of civilians have died. Millions more fled the threat of fighting uh, from Ukraine. A German study has found that the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war cost the world economy a whopping $1.3 trillion. That's in 2022 alone. According to a study published by the German Economic Institute on Tuesday, Western economies were particularly affected as they lost two-thirds of their global production. For 2023 alone, the uh, Institute is, projects an additional global value added loss of $1 trillion. Unfortunately, the all clear is not yet in sight, it says, warning that raw materials, raw material shortages and uncertainty would continue to occupy the uh, world until 2023 and the cost of prosperity. I want to bring in now geopolitical analyst and U.S. military veteran Major Adebayo Adeliki. He's been with us this journey as we started off discussing uh, the war in Ukraine. Major, thank you so much for making time to be with us today, the anniversary of this war. Let's look at how much has been spent already. We've made estimates. Uh, the world has made estimates, but we know that it goes even much more. The billions of dollars in military aid, um, the U.S. announcing another $2 billion today. A human cost of the war already, over 100,000 people killed, many more homeless or displaced. Is this still a fight for justice for Ukraine, for Ukraine's sovereignty? Is this still what it's about? No, it's way beyond that. Uh, thank you, Amarashi, for having me. Uh, just like yesterday, it seemed as if we were just here talking about the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russian forces. And uh, now uh, it is it's just, uh, you know, a year later and we're still talking about it. Like I said earlier, this is not going to be a, 
a kick, uh, I mean, a walk in the park, rather, uh, for either of the countries involved in it. As you can see, Ukrainian forces and Ukrainian uh, forces, uh, despite uh, having not much but the free support from the Western world, they've been able to held back, uh, you know, the, uh, the Russian, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggression. So it's very interesting. Yeah, like you said, um, this is beyond uh, fight for freedom. This is a lot. This is become. This has become something else. So the stand of the Western democracy against uh, what they call autocratic government from the Russian uh, regime. So this is what is all about. This has become a proxy war uh, between the Western nations and the the non-Western nations. But what is what? As you can see, there's a lot of chatter about the Chinese actually supporting the Russian with some drones from their hand. And if the Chinese actually are uh, goes through with it, this becomes, this probably the, the biggest uh, kind of uh, leapfrog by the, by the Chinese in their support for, uh, you know, for what is going on uh, in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, invasion. So it kind of changes the dynamics of things. As you can see, the world that is being reshaped by this war, uh, you know, you've seen the Western allies on one side and uh, non-Western allies on, on the other side. And there's some countries that they are undecided as well. Uh, standing in the middle, so this is the is the clearing call. The Ukraine uh, Ukraine crisis or conflict, rather, is a clearing call for who is with democratic values and who is not with democratic values. That's what the world is all about at the moment. Is is it really? Because I mean, before before nations declare wars, I mean, it, it has to be thought out. It's a process. Um, you exhaust every means of. Uh, uh, diplomatic uh, negotiations before, you know, the, the breakdown of war, which is some form of diplomacy, actually now takes place. Uh, do you think that the West actually had been targeting Russia right from the start and that instigating Ukraine to seek NATO membership was part of the plan? Not really. I think the whole thing just developed fast. I don't have the inside information to be able to ascertain uh, what you just said, but I believe uh, prior to this invasion, now if, if, you, if you recall uh, correctly, that the U.S. has been kind of uh, saying this, that there is going to be a war, there is war coming. Everyone's like, no, it's not. Because they are prior to this thing actually getting to what it actually has gotten into right now, uh, there has been a lot of hours of negotiation. Of course, they've reached an impasse, and that's why they couldn't just go forward with it. So, of course, the U.S. knowing fully well how this whole thing kind of plan out, having dealt with Russia uh, from the USSR era through the Cold War, after the Cold War, they understand their tactics for the most part. So they understand that this thing eventually lead to a kind of grinding Cold War, proxy war that we finally have seen ourselves in there. And also, this this thing is actually permeating to different era exam and to, to different era entirely. As you can see as well, we've seen the effect of it in uh, in Africa, as you can see, Mali and Burkina Faso chasing out uh, France and also welcoming Russia as well. So now the, the, the fight is not only in the in the Eurasia region mm -hmm. and that part is now actually bringing. It's not only, I mean, the fight is now getting back to Africa as also uh, a landing zone for the proxy war. So these things, and you mentioned the cost of one point three trillion dollars. Uh, this far reaching more than that. I mean, in the U.S., we are actually. Uh, we're still experiencing the the aftermath of this whole thing, and actually, the President Biden has yet to explain to American people why the U.S. is leading the forefront to Ukraine. Because right now, we are paying a uh, huge cost on this war, and uh, but understand as we understand that democratic values have to be defended. Because that's, I mean, if we don't de defend democratic values, then what becomes of the free world? But at what cost is it? Because at some point, Americans will get to a point of be like. It will be like, what, to what extent are we going to be able to defend this? And now that we've pledged another $2 billion and the other countries are pledging, Ukraine is flooded with Western weapons. And at some point, uh, they will come to an agreement how this whole world is going to hang. And then what's going to happen to all this war, all this, uh, you know, all this equipment on this, uh, on this country? Something's going to happen with it. I mean, American tax dollars are at play. I'm sure other countries are. Uh, there are, there are tax pounds or tax dollars at play as well. Euro is at play as well. So the, the whole cost of this thing, people that don't even have uh, uh, people that don't even have uh, play in it, have been uh, actually ripping the 
So, I mean, they're just getting to, I mean, people that are not in play in it, they are getting to, uh, you know, they're getting the short end of the stick of it. So uh, that's what Ukraine and Russia has gotten us to at this point. Major, you, you've done um, a number of tours in Iraq as well as in Afghanistan. You, you've seen war face to face. You've had to experience that. And then you've seen the cost of war itself, how much money is spent in developing these military weapons. Ukraine has those Leopard 2 tanks coming in from Poland. They're also expecting even more weapons uh, from other European countries um, also coming in. And, and then President Volodymyr Zelensky has been calling for F-16 fighter jets. Some European countries are preparing to offer that to him as well. In the end, Ukraine is incurring a huge military debt. So at the end of this war, um, is that really freedom? Because this still puts Ukraine, you know, in the indebtedness of the West while still trying to win a war. I think what I'm really trying to ask is, do, will these weapons really, really help Ukraine gain the upper hand against Russia? Is it a possibility, knowing how big the Russian military is and the support they're getting from countries like China, and not even to talk about India? Absolutely. So it's a very interesting and yet uh, complex question you have, Samarachi, because there is no way you kind of scan it. Uh, you, you have to define what is freedom. Uh, and to the, uh, to the Ukrainian people, actually judging from what their president has been stating, ability to kind of water down the Russian invasion to them is freedom. They will want to be able to stand on their own without looking behind their back that Russia is coming or Russia is not. Of course, they've incurred a lot of debt. Of course, they, I mean, the, the, the cost of this war is so far reaching. It's so far reaching. We don't even know the end of it yet. Apart from the global, uh, you know, the whole world are trying to plunge the, the global, I mean, global economy into a crisis as we as we said, uh, the Ukrainian people have to be paying this in for, for generations to come. And I mean, to be honest with you, all this thing that's been shipped to, to Ukraine at some point, they have to figure out a way to pay it back. It's not nothing is given for free, you know. Uh, so uh, and then the amount of people that have died. Honestly, I, I personally and I shared my opinion on this platform that the best way to to do this is to actually uh, figure out a way to get Russia uh, into, uh, on, I mean, into a room and then just talk about the way actually Russia will bow out of this gracefully without being uh, kind of defaced in this point of, uh, that's the only way that everybody kind of, we have to reach a point that is a win-win for everyone. But to be honest with you, everyone is at a loss. And to the rest, to the rest of the Western nation, they can afford this. Uh, Ukraine cannot. The rest of Western work and I mean, they, they really can afford it. And uh, there are other ways they can play these things. And yeah. they also they also have to realize that some of the countries that are over here, even Russia, has some kind of relationship with the United States as well. So yeah. it's a Major, very Major, interesting... If you, could just, if, if, if you could just pause here for a minute, I want to bring in Ambassador Keshi, uh, the diplomat uh, in our midst. Um, he's a former uh, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Ambassador Keshi, thank you for joining in the conversation. Um, we have just been talking about, you know, how far Ukraine has gone in this war. Um, Major Adeliki has been explaining to us the cost of the war itself. And, you know, they're still open, you know, on the table, still on the table, I want to believe, um, the aspect of uh, negotiations. Do you still think that Russia is willing to return to the negoti negotiating table at this point with the way it's piling up military weapons against Ukraine and the way it's going at it with those missile strikes? Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Russia has ever been interested in negotiation. And I do not see Russia one year after interested in any negotiation. It's gone past the whole idea of negotiation. When you come to think that uh, when this war started, everybody thought that it wouldn't last long. The Russians themselves thought that it wouldn't last long. They've done everything they believe they, uh, uh, was possible for them to win the war. They've destroyed virtually all uh, um, infrastructure. They've destroyed schools. They've destroyed hospitals. They've destroyed uh, residential you know, quarters you know, around the country. And the last thing they did to punish Ukrainians was to blow up all the um, 
uh, all the power stations so that they could suffer during the winter and hopefully surrender. The Ukrainians have shown so much resilience, courage, and determination to, you know, to continue to fight for their freedom. And so that itself poses a challenge to, you know, to, uh, to Russia. And from what uh, the Russian president said a few days ago, I'm not too sure that he's prepared to, you know, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, sit at the negotiation ta table. Right, you also have to recognize why we have this war. People have just thought that, oh, it's the expansion. Look, it's more than the expansion of um, NATO. You've got to go back and look at the history of the two countries. There's so much bitterness, you know, historical bitterness, that is very difficult for people to, to understand. And that was exactly what the Russian president expressed in a speech he made before the war, talking about Ukraine being part of the fatherland. And this has continued. For the Ukrainians, too, they have some bitterness against the Russians that they have been so dominated, so badly treated, that this time they are determined to fight, you know, for their freedom. So when you find two people with this sort of bitterness and anger, it becomes very difficult. Look, what are you going to offer China, uh, Russia at this point in time to make peace? Practically nothing. It has become sort of pride for the leadership that such a small, innocuous, quote-unquote, country, you know, could stand up the Russian beer. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so difficult. I, I don't make the Russian president decide that enough is enough. Indeed. Ambassador Keshi, uh, we're so sorry you came in um, just at the nick of time, even though we seem to be running out of it. Gentlemen, thank you so much, uh, Major Adebayo Adeliki, uh, for your time. Ambassador Keshi, thank you so much. We know that these discussions continue even after now. I appreciate you, gentlemen. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just very quickly before we go, a tropical cyclone Freddy made landfall in Mozambique. It's been re-strengthening in the Mozambique Channel with winds up to 120 kilometers, 28 kilometers per hour. After landfall, the storm system will be slowly, slowly moving in southern Mozambique, producing up to 400 millimeters of rain over the next few days. It's likely to lead to major flooding across the region, which may well shift into Zimbabwe and northeast South Africa by next week. Weather in the United States, a massive winter storm churning across the country has left at least one person dead. It's knocked out power for hundreds of thousands of people and cut off travel around the nation. Grand Rapids officials say a volunteer firefighter there came in contact with a live power line knocked down by ice in the city's suburb. The National Weather Service says a broad swathe of the U.S. from Washington State to New England is under advisories with another 18 inches of snow and wind chills equal to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the world today on the Russian invasion. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Urbani. Bye.